could it done, what could it do, and how could I make that work with modern technology? Obviously, there are problems with Trajan's column because it's like 120 feet tall, and nobody really can see it very well unless they're that tall. And if you're 120 feet tall, you've got other problems. To deal with. <laughs> it's also only written in Latin, which doesn't appeal to most people, um, except type designers love Latin, but there are visitors from all over the world, so how tall would it have to be to have all the language? And what would be required for an engine to lift it up and take it on a world tour and that kind of stuff is all like, and then I fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> what survived that was building the perfect what, which is uh, something that's a question in everybody's mind at some point when they're working on creative work. And so I thought I'd assemble a panel of people who could uh, describe their journeys from imagining and creative things through the technologies that we have to work with. Um, and I, I got a wide variety of people to uh, join me on this. The first one is, uh, the first slide, please. I'm gonna do it myself. Uh, Martina Flor, would you come up please? She's wearing a perfect soccer uniform. And um, Martina is a lettering artist and she explains it better than I do. I'm a lettering artist. <laughs> See what I mean? It is <laughs> Our second contestant, <laughs> Lady Chiggy. <laughs> She's also a different kind of lettering artist who is working in some difficult scripts. At least one. But again, she's better at introducing herself than I am. Hola, Barcelona. <laughs> I'm, I'm a type designer. I design Arabic typefaces and I do legibility studies for Arabic, Latin, and these days Chinese as well. Caleb is next. And he rides Buffalo. <laughs> He is in the Adobe Font Group, and he will say a little bit more about his job. Uh, yeah, I'm a product manager with Adobe Typekit Group, and I've uh, been with Adobe about 19 years. I didn't get the soccer memo, uh, so I'm wearing a, an open source soccer team jersey. <laughs> and then we have our mystery guest. And Simon is well known to most of you, but he'll tell you more. Yeah, hi, I'm Simon. It's I Daniels. I manage pop production at Microsoft. And, <laughs> and I, uh, this year I picked up icons, so I manage icons for the operating systems group too. So fonts and icons together. Fonts and James Dean. That's what I do. And our fifth and final contestant is David Patel from Google. I don't even know where to begin, <laughs> but we'll search for something. It's a real honor to be here, and I want to say I'm really, truly humbled. With web fonts, we're able to quantify the impact that this industry has on the web and humanity, and it's just completely breathtaking. So I thank you for all of your hard work. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? <laughs> I'll start out. Um, uh, starting with Martina, there comes a point in the letter design process where the knowledge of the curve that's made by hand must be translated into the points on the curve of the digital data. And I noticed in your presentation, people were drawn really fast. I assume that was you. And then instantly, they turned into digital images. And I know there's more to it than that. 
So how do you deal with this in your work and how do you teach this translation from handwork to digital work? Um, well, it's, it's another uh, step on the process, actually. So this, there's a design you're working on, and uh, you go from analog to digital, according to the project. Um, I mostly work by hand. I start by hand because it's the faster way to, to make uh, decisions and to solve problems, and then you can move into the digital drawing um, and uh, start moving the anthropons around, right? Um, but of course, there's a certain technique that makes this translation from analog to digital uh, a bit easier, which is using three points. I, I bet uh, everyone is, um, is acquainted with that technique. Um, yeah, so, but there's definitely a development that, is, that I made by hand, um, which is vital or very important for the, the digital translation. Later. And so sometimes I guess the client says, no, I don't like the translation, I like the, the hand-drawn look. Does that, that, that must happen every once in a while, because I see a lot of stuff coming out that is actually hand-drawn, not necessarily from you, but from a lot of people. There must be agencies that say, nah, forget it. Yeah, I think, I think this is a matter also of, of the sort of work you show. I mean, I work... The show, the, the, I show the work that I like to get. So whenever, uh, whoever comes to my portfolio, they can actually see that how, how my work looks and they, they will ask for that, right? Um, yeah, it, it doesn't happen often that someone asks me to do a certain job that looks handmade or that has a rough look when, uh, when they come to me, actually. They, they are looking for a digital result. Uh, yeah. Um, then, for the last 20 years or so, connected, colored, and treated type have been moving around in digital files as logos or as fonts with instruction sets, where the user has to change fonts and change colors to achieve the final translation. But now, in the wake of the brand emoji emergence, um, color icon fonts, as Simon just mentioned, and font formats are moving towards layers of color for separate colors within the same font, as you're aware. Um, so much like the situation above, where you're translating from your hand-drawn shapes to digital shapes, the designer's appreciation of the letter translation of digital is key to making these color perfect words. And the letter designer's uh, future appreciation of connected color and treated type and how that translates best into the emerging font format standards are about to become your imagination's next frontier. Yeah, I haven't seen <laughs> Yeah, I have to think about this again of, uh, because I haven't seen anything um, still groundbreaking in color fonts. I mean, all the, all the examples I've seen are um, uh, uh, colorization of an existing font, so it, um, I've been working with texture and color, and uh, um, and I, I yeah, I feel that I still, I still have this freedom to do that in lettering. Still, I don't see how this translates with color fonts into fonts. Um, it's mostly going to be an ease of use issue, I think. For users, no longer have to track things like PDF files that have their logo in it. Their logo will become part of a font. And so will much of the kinds of work that you're doing make it easier for users to access the, the color. Yeah, I think, I think in, in this sense, when it comes to, to design fonts, then it's another layer of control that we, we are going to get in this sense. No? Uh, we are, it's, it's another layer of control that the designer might have. So now you can control which color or uh, which variety of textures this font can have. And it's not... Um, it's not depending entirely on the user anymore, but we have as designers, we have to control that. Um, yeah, but I, th I would still like to see like a nice example of that. See, Simon, we'll get there. Okay, so maybe much like the color, the situation of color fonts and exactly like the situation of Latin script, there's a designer's appreciation of the words as they form in the Arabic. 
uh, being translated <coughs> into available technology standards and then surviving compliance issues across platforms to use it. How does the democratization of that font development process happening according to your point of view? So there's um, two points that would be interesting here. Um, one, uh, if you look at the development of uh, typography and any technology related to that from the day types that into what we have today, the latest development, which is really big, has been web fonts. And uh, for the first time in, in the history of Arabic typography, uh, when, so I know this is gonna sound like an advertisement, and I'm sorry it does that, <laughs> but in, in 2009, I think it was 2009, when fonts.com offered web fonts, it was the first time that the technology is hitting the street for Latin and Arabic at the same time. It was never like this before. It was always decades or at best years where Arabic would be able to get the same technology as you would have in Latin. And at that point, we were finally able to be on the same ground, that we are able to have web fonts in Arabic at the same time as somebody sitting in the US is able to have a web font in Latin. So that was amazing for me. And, and like, nobody was even fussing about it, but for me, like, my God, brown groundbreaking that this is finally happening. Of course, the adoption date in the Middle East sucks. No? So of course, it takes forever <laughs> for them to find out that this is actually possible, but that's a different story. But technology-wise, it was really amazing. So that was the first thing. The second thing is that, um, so again, because it's a complex script, uh, technology required to uh, typeset Arabic has always been very complicated. But with recent advances with, with um, typing with Unicode to open type to the font tools that we have, so these days, even a complex Arabic is not that hard to design anymore. And, and all you need is a, your laptop, and your software, and you sit there, and you design, and you don't need 500 engineers, or thousands and thousands of characters. It's really, really easy now, for the first time. It was never like this. It was always a nightmare. And I always, I'm very thankful that I am alive now, not 20 years ago, or 100 years ago. We're know. all, we're all happy. <laughs> yeah, and, and, Every damn one of us. Yeah, and, and to be like, and like I, so 10 years ago, when I, was typing in type design in Arabic, I thought, okay, to design a simple Arabic is easy, but to do something very complex, like, for example, what Thomas Milo does, this is too advanced and too much. But now I'm working with glyphs and designing is so easy, even the hard, complex stuff. And it was never like this before, ever. So, yeah, I'm, I'm happy. Okay, so <laughs> I, I've noticed that you are happy. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've, so I've, so. <laughs> I've noticed I've been following a little bit of social media, uh, in social media, and you're letting a large variety of followers critique the Arabic designs that you do live. Yeah. And I'm wondering how that, among many democratization factors, is working in your process. So. So that specifically was related to the Pinot Arabic, which I started two years ago, and I still have not finished, but I'm almost there, so I'm kerning, so you know, the end is inside. So, uh, and what the project, the nature of the project is that it's a hybrid calligraphy style. So I have Nastarit and I have Nast, and I'm sort of mixing and inventing a new calligraphy style. And I'm not a calligrapher, and you know, I can't even draw my hand. I prefer to typeset things because my handwriting sucks. So I, I'm, I'm not, I don't have the skill set to invent the graphic style. And, and I sort of you know, found my way into it. But often when you, when you have hybrids of styles in whichever script or language you're working in, what you want to make sure is that you're not ending up with Frankenstein, that, that the actual end result is something believable. And that is something you cannot judge on your own because you get so used to the forms, they become normal because I've spent two years now looking at them. And that, um, for that combination to work, it needs to, it needs to appeal to the uh, collective visual memory that the audience has. And that you cannot have without asking people. So if then it's natural to post things on Facebook and on Twitter and ask people, guys, are you able to read this? And they're like, oh, yes, great. And, and then sometimes I, I post like, ah, oh, I have these alternates which we prepared like recently from two days ago. All of people on Facebook wanted the one on the right. Everybody on Twitter wanted the one on the left. So. <laughs> but <laughs> you still have to find your own way with the design. You still have to take things with a grain of salt. 
but um, it, it's still it's still nice to have that kind of feedback that you are able to ask leaders if they are comfortable with the aesthetic that you are putting, if they're comfortable accepting it. And then if it's believable, then it works. And, and <clears throat> like I always think of type design as like playing with a rubber band, and then you can always push and push and push and stretch things, but it should not break. That's when that's when the public acceptance of like people look like, oh no, what's wrong with it? And maybe they can't pinpoint. But that's when you mess things up when you combine. But if you find a logic and way to combine things and ask people, then they become part of the design process. I, I don't know if I would do this with typefaces that are less complex. It might be fun. It, but yeah, it, it's uh, sometimes, especially when you're pushing boundaries, uh, it's, it's too much responsibility to be the only person with size. It's nice to democratize that process. I still get to be dictator at the end of the day, and I decide. <laughs> but, uh, but, but the feedback is, is interesting, and it helps you find your way. I, I very much understand that, and I, I've I've thought about different ways of handling that myself, and sort of came up with this notion of you know, not really designing a typeface, but telling people that I was doing it, and then sort of starting them line and just letting them finish it, and going away <laughs> somewhere like to the Caribbean or something, <laughs> coming back and having it done. So, good work. <laughs> um, Caleb, you there? Yeah. Thank you. Um, following the idea of the letter designer and the font designer imagining the words and typography first and then figure out the underlying code to match, or figure out some sort of a social environment in which to do it, the creators of complex documents imagine typography layout, timing, and UI issues as well as the other things we've already discussed, depending on their content. And then they do some combination of interactivity and or coding to divine the uh, the underlying code and data that's going to make the pages or data flow happen. So, in multinational and multilingual application suites, which I know that you're not really charging as a font person, but you were working on those before. Thank you. Come on. They may seem similar. Maybe you think you're answering this question. I'll get you. Got it. I'll get you. <laughs> and see these right. Yeah, I mean, you're very close to It leads to me to ask uh, um, if the most complete fonts are becoming mind bogglingly complex, as David Lemon just pointed out, uh, Adobe itself needed considerable help getting these fonts. Um, isn't the application suite's interface typography getting to be multi mind boggling? That was a large question. Thank I you. No. Um, you only have two seconds to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think the answer is a yes, though <laughs> you have to kind of ratchet that back a little bit. Um, a lot of the things that you described, I think, are going to be challenging. And if you look at um, and I speak mostly for Adobe applications, because that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, you've seen them get mind-bogglingly complex over the years. And someone showed a Swiss Army knife that was about a foot wide the other day, and, and we've heard that about Photoshop for many years because there are so many different types of customers. Um, I think as type evolves, and I'm fairly new to type being here about four, four and a half years or so, um, I've seen so much change just in the time that I be began four years ago, web fonts, mobile, um, server fonts, lots of different types of uses. And I think the tools will have to adjust uh, as, as these new things. And it hasn't stopped as far as I can tell. I mean, it's just, it's bonkers out there. And anybody that's in the type world knows staying on top of the tools that are out there and, and staying you know, productive and learning what the new stuff is that's coming up is very important. I guess the key question is, you know, where is that UI? Because UI and workflow are related. And I guess the best thing I can say is that David mentioned our uh, OTC, um, our uh, open type font that we just released, uh, Surf on Sands. I mean, a lot of that is uh, you install one font with four languages, but between the combination of the data and the font and the operating system, 
you see four separate fonts in the UI. So that's already kind of solved to a certain extent. Other problems are solved in the app menus, and we try and help as a type team to influence that for all of our products. Others may be outside. A good example is um, TypeKit. Our TypeKit services uh, are um, products that complement Creative Cloud. So recently, we just hooked up um, the missing font dialog in our products, Illustrator, InDesign, and Photoshop. And so now, when you have a missing font, uh, it allows you to go to TypeKit. We're still working on that, and the hope is that eventually we'll be able to identify those fonts and make it reduce that friction that customers are feeling when they suddenly don't have a font and they don't know where to get it. We're hoping we can send people in whatever way it is, whether it's TypeKit or any other font foundry to get that. So I, I think that what you're saying is things are getting more complex, and definitely they're going to continue to. We have to keep solving those problems as, as more power comes to Okay. Um, open source sans. Um, seven weights of a font with italic and monospace, each of which includes 65,535 lift in one size master. Let's just pretend that there were five point size masters, which would bring you up to a couple of million lifts in the family. After you recovered, if one adds these masters, I'm sorry, it becomes a 10, right now it's a million grip. If you change it to a bunch of size masters, it easily gets up to about 10. Oh, it's two million grip now, maybe 10 million. If one has two or three families, you're talking about somebody getting 50 million lift in, in being needed to be used in a project, say for corporate, international corporate type, you've got 30 or 40, 50 million lift. Um, which leads me to ask if users are, in your experience, looking for them, if they're working with families, are they interested in glyph management software that's attached to Sweep so that they can sort of Manage this gigantic lift of characters down to see what they're actually using. How can we see that? Well, first of all, I, I have to tell you that's just crazy. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm not I'm making this up, though. <laughs> no, <laughs> I just uh, read your marketing material. <laughs> no, it, it, it's definitely. I think it can be a possibility. Uh, I think for me, it was an eye-opening experience to be part of the Surf on the Sands project. It was a long one. We, we involved a lot of different companies to get it. Built and uh, right now it's just under half a million clips, and so it's still staggering to think of that many characters you can choose from. And, and my, uh, I really have to congratulate um, any of the Asian-speaking people on the fact that they can, you know, deal with that many characters, and that's so critical to their language. Um, I think, uh, in a way, people are already in that situation, though certainly not to the scope of 65,000 characters, but we've seen some of our, um, our users and uh, how many fonts they actually are installing at any one time in the font management systems that are out there. We still today, I think 10 years later, are having customers ask us for ATM. They would like to have ATM. Um, I don't know where the font management is going to come from. There's certainly uh, solutions out there that many people use. Um, and certainly if we ended up doing something along the lines of what you're describing, where we have 10 million lists, that's an awful lot of lists to manage. Um, I think in our case, we made it open source because we knew that in, in many situations, people would want to customize that font and, and reduce that and subset it. And so the question is whether or not something of that size over that many uh, variations is going to be usable or not. Um, I'm not sure where the solution is coming from. It may come from Adobe. Right now, we haven't had any, anyone you know, indicate that that's required. But uh, what you're describing is certainly something, um, particularly in the Asian languages, that might be worth about. I, I'm re-asking this question that I asked 10 years ago uh, at a conference like this where representatives of all the companies who make operating systems were there. And the answer then was that they wanted to leave it up to third-party developers who were then 
there are quite a few uh, fund uh, management software companies back then, and not very many left. And so, as a user, I, I wake up every morning and I go to my font, I mean, before breakfast. And uh, it keeps me on a diet, actually. It spoils my, my appetite. And they're just like, there's 90 fonts in my menu that are for languages I've never been used. And I'll admit that I do get mail from some of these languages where they do want to set in the native tongue, even though I don't read it, and I delete the mail, and that's the only thing those fonts ever do on my system, is show me some other language. That, so I'm, it's part of the personal, I'll read the law. Nobody does that. Yeah. So, and the reason why Simon thinks that I'm repeating these questions is because it keeps on building, the same question keeps on building the font, uh, the font, the letter and font design imagines the words and typography first, and then interactively, for the most part, interactively, you find the underlying code and put them in the font. Uh, the creators of complex documents imagine typography, layout, timing, UI issues again, depending on their content. And this becomes a huge team sport when the OS and the application developer starts to imagine the perfect OS for hosting complex multilingual fonts. And like multilingual fonts for a wide variety of media types in authoring apps cross-platform language. 